everyone. Caroline Friday, Neighborhood Bible Study. We're finishing up chapter 13 of the book of Matthew, and they're going to move on to chapter 14 quickly. The last session, we looked at the parable of the wheat and the tares, where Jesus explains the principles of the kingdom, and he gives a prophetic message to his disciples that there's going to be an end-time separation between the wheat and the tares, where the angels were going to filter out the evil people who refused to accept Jesus as Messiah, and those people would be burned and would suffer great judgment. But those who believed and those who received the truth, that they would shine forth and they would inherit the kingdom, and great and wonderful blessings would come upon them. And I believe that that did happen in 70 AD, that that old temple sacrificial system was brought to a close, and the new covenant the new kingdom of God was ushered in, and those who will receive it by faith, it is theirs. And it's an everlasting kingdom. It will never end, an everlasting kingdom that will go on forever and ever. Um, and so we saw in the last uh, verse that we looked at that um, he says, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which brings forth out of his treasure things new and things old. So what I glean from that, and that's verse 52 of chapter 13, is there's going to be treasure in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. For those of us who look at Scripture and, and look for the mysteries of the kingdom and see the truths that point to Jesus Christ, you can find all of that in the Old Testament, starting in the book of Genesis, going all the way through to the last book, um, the book of Malachi, you can see the treasures that point to Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, the church. It was hidden away, hidden away so that it could be revealed at the appropriate time. And then the new treasures are the, the gospel of grace, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Those are the new things that we find in the New, new Testament, in the gospels, and the letters of the apostles. And those new things reveal and explain these wonderful mysteries that were held at bay for generations until such a time as Jesus came and revealed it to the whole world through the teachings of his apostles and his disciples and through the church. And the church is the wonderful mystery. Uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That wonderful mystery was... Um, was to be revealed at the appropriate time, and, and it was, and it still is being revealed through us, the body of Christ. And that is our job, is to reveal the truth of who the church is. We are the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are called to be his hands and his feet on this earth. He is in, in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. Um, he is the head of the church, but we are his body, and he requires that we do the things he wants us to do while we're here on the earth. Um, the last little bit of 13, um, verse 53, it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed hence, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence has this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren James, and uh, Jose's, and Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Which then has this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, and in his own house. And he did not many works, many mighty works there, because of their unbelief. These verses right here prove to me that he, as a young boy, was not going around performing all kinds of wonderful miracles that some people want us to believe. Some people want us to believe that he was this very strange child from the moment he was born and he was doing all kinds of mystical things as a little boy. Absolutely not. The Bible says that the first of all of his miracles was a turning of water into wine. He was a normal Jewish boy. He did not know sin, he but he was a normal Jewish boy. He grew up in the Jewish culture. The Bible says he grew up in, with, uh, in favor with God and with man. 
Um, even his own parents, when he was 12 years old and he was left behind in Jerusalem, his parents, they searched for him for three days. They couldn't find him. He was in the temple discussing the scriptures with the scribes and the Pharisees. So if he had been this mystical um, prophet type child who was espousing spiritual truths everywhere he went, um, surely his parents, the first place they would have gone is the temple to search for him there. But no, obviously it was one of the last places they went and they found him. And his mother, or they said, um, were you not concerned? We were worried about you. And he said, well, did you not know that I had to be about my father's kingdom, my father's business? And, and the truth was, it was not time for him to be about his father's business. He had not yet developed enough. He was not ready. The time had not come. He had to wait 18 more years before he was about 30 years old and he was baptized by John the Baptist and anointed Messiah. And then his ministry began. But he needed to grow and develop and mature. And so that is exactly what happened. So that the people of his own hometown, when he came to them as Messiah, and he is performing the miracles and, and doing all the things that he had done before and, and relaying great words of wisdom and telling them about this kingdom, they're offended because they think, well, this is just... This is just that Jewish boy, um, Mary's son, the carpenter's son. Uh, who is he to think that he is the Messiah? So they were offended because they looked at him uh, as just a common man. Um, nowhere do we see them judging him and pointing their finger and saying, well, he is a sinner because we knew he knew no sin. But they're offended because he doesn't line up with their definition of who they think Messiah should be. I believe if he had done all kinds of miracles as a boy, then maybe they would have said, oh, yes, I remember when he did all these miracles as a young boy. I remember when he healed this person and he healed that person. Yes, he is the Messiah. Absolutely not. You don't hear any of that. The opposite is true. He was a normal Jewish boy growing up in a normal Jewish home. And when the time was right, he was revealed to Israel as Messiah. And those who had faith and had eyes to see and ears to hear, they believed and they received. And they escaped that judgment that came on the world. Some of them were martyred. Some of them were deeply and terribly persecuted. But some of them escaped. And uh, the others that rejected it. They were judged. And so we also see a principle here that the prophet in his own hometown is uh, doesn't receive the honor that he or she may receive in other places. We know that's true for those of us who are called um, to do things for the Lord. Maybe we get born again and we become a new creation in Christ Jesus and we become new. Our, our spirits become alive to God and God writes his laws in our heart. And we really are new people, even though on the outside we look the same. Well, people who've known us from our past, our family, they, they look at us and they say, well, you're not any different than you've always been. I remember when you did X, Y, and Z, and I remember when you uh, said all these things, and how can you say that you are a new creation? How can you say you're a child of God? How can you say that you're no longer a sinner? Um, and so it's hard for people to accept the gospel coming from the lips of people who they know have lived normal lives and maybe even sinful lives. Um, so again, it takes faith. You would have to really blind your eyes, your natural eyes, so to speak. And you would have to listen. What is this person saying? Are they speaking truth? Am I able to receive truth from an individual who I've known all my life and known that they weren't perfect? But now I see there's a change. Now I see that they're different. I see they have a revelation. They have wisdom and knowledge and understanding that I'm longing to understand and I'm longing to know. And I'm going to receive from them. So, you know, again, a spiritual principle that um, the hometown, the, the people who know us best sometimes 
are the ones who are most offended by truth. And, you know, this was true with Israel. Israel, the nation, knew Jesus better than any of the Gentile people. They had all the prophecies of Messiah. They had time to examine what he had to say and how he lived his life. They had ample knowledge, and yet they rejected because they were offended in him. And the Gentile people who didn't know prophecy, and they didn't know the uh, Jewish scriptures and all the things that God had given Israel, they didn't know those things. So they weren't as easily offended, but they did look with their eyes, their spiritual eyes and their ears, and they saw and they heard and they received. Um, so it's, it's a spiritual principle that we shouldn't be shocked today if some of our friends and family members can't receive from us. Just pray that God will bring other people uh, who they can receive from. Um, let's move on to chapter 14. And this is about the death of John the Baptist. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto us, his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do for, show forth uh, themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. See, so Herod the Tetrarch had taken his brother's wife as his own, which was against the laws of Israel. And John the Baptist, a, the final prophet of that old covenant system, had judged him and had pointed his finger and said, You're in sin. He didn't like it, and she didn't like it. Verse 5, And when he would have put him to death, he, and this is uh, Herod, feared the multitude because they counted him, John the Baptist, as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples, this is John the Baptist's disciples, came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. So this is important because we learn that John the Baptist is the Elijah who was to come. The promised Elijah was going to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord to uh, make straight paths for the Lord. And we know that John the Baptist is that Elijah. He had the spirit of Elijah on him. And Jesus said, if you can bear it, if you can receive it, he is that Elijah. And so we see this front runner, forerunner for Jesus that um, was declaring repentance to receive from the Lord, to receive God's plan for righteousness and salvation. That that front runner is to an end. His head is cut off. It's really a rejection again by the nation of God's plan. We see, well, I see in scripture a shift in Jesus's teaching. He goes from being uh, uh, the Messiah who's healing and delivering the multitudes and sharing parables with his disciples to really um, showing the disciples wonderful spiritual principles uh, as to how they are to operate in the kingdom once he goes, once he leaves this earth. Here is how you are to operate. Here is how you are to advance the kingdom. These are the spiritual principles that you are to walk in. And so we're going to see that here in the feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus heard of it, John the Baptist's death, he departed hence by ship into a desert place apart. See, he knows that his time is coming. He's going to be going to the cross very shortly. 
And when the people had heard of it thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. Jesus Christ is always moved by compassion. Compassion uh, for people who are following him, thronging him, wanting what he has, wanting to be delivered from that satanic um, temple system of condemnation and judgment and never being good enough and never feeling like God loves you and never feeling like God is pleased with you. You're constantly under the mastery of sin and death and the curse. And so they're thronging him because they want the deliverance he offers, the salvation that he offers. And he is moved with compassion. He is a compassionate savior. He's very different from the high priest and the priest of the temple system who are not compassionate. You know, relit, religious people, really extremely religious people, in my experience, are not compassionate people. They may be good people, and they may be knowledgeable people, and they may give their money to the church and all that, but they are cold and cruel on occasion and really can be harsh and hard. But Jesus is not that way. He's very compassionate, and he, he wants to go off, I believe, and be with his heavenly Father and get the strength that he needs to move forward in what God has called him to do, which is ultimately to go to the cross. And they throng him and move with compassion. He heals their sick. And when it was evening, this is verse 15, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart Give them, give ye them to eat. In other words, feed them. And they said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples then to the multitudes, and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full, and they that had eaten were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Historians believe it could have been up to twenty thousand people um, who were fed that day. Now this is a hugely significant event something that the disciples have never seen. Israel has never seen this. They were fed in the wilderness when they fled Egypt. They were fed in the wilderness with manna, and they collected every day. They were allowed to collect only that which they could eat for that day, except for um, before the Sabbath, they could collect for two days because they weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. So for, two, so for that day, the preparation day, they could collect double the amount for the Sabbath. If they collected more, if they stored up more, it would rot. And it was a sign from God that he was going to be their provider, but they were going to have to look to him every single day for their provision. And he would be there and provide. He would provide manna. He provided water from the rock. He provided the, the quail for them to eat. Um, and so here, Jesus Christ is saying, you disciples, and when he says you disciples, he's really saying you church, body of Christ, my hands and my feet, you feed them, you do the impossible, you do what the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees could never do, they would have to go buy food, that would be impossible. Well, first of all, they probably wouldn't have had the money. Secondly, how are you going to have time to go into the city, buy all the food, bring it back, distribute it? There wouldn't be time to do that. So this is an impossible, supernatural act that Jesus is saying, 
you disciples have the power and the authority to do it in my name. By me, by my authority, which I'm giving to you, you feed them. And of course, they don't know how to do that, but they do bring him what they have. All they have are two fish and five loaves. It's two little fish and five loaves. They were probably little uh, pita bread type little loaves of uh, bread with two fish. And they have to feed 20,000 people with this. Now, what is the spiritual lesson? For me, on the other side of the cross, the spiritual lesson is this. If you are a born-again child of God, God is going to ask you, the Heavenly Father is going to ask you to do things for the kingdom because he has compassion on people. He cares for hurting people. He is going to ask you to do impossible things for him. I mean impossible, supernatural things that the world would say you can't do unless you have X amount of money and these connections and this education level and all sorts of things. There's a whole list of things as to why uh, the world tells you that you can't do the things God has called you to do. But what he does say is, okay, take what little you have. What do you have? Has he called you to form a ministry to help people on whom he has compassion? And you say, it's impossible because I don't have the resources I need. He may say, okay, what do you have? Lay it out on a table. What do you have? Um, okay, I have a smartphone and a music stand and a Bible and a notebook and a pen and years of studying the Word. Okay, take that and start with the little bit you have. Offer it up to God. Ask him to bless it. Offer it up to him and allow him to show you how to use it for his glory. And then what's going to happen is miracles will begin to happen. Things will begin to happen that you could not imagine uh, happening. And it, this has been true from the time the kingdom began. It started right here. 20,000 people were fed with two little fish and five loaves because of the spiritual truth in this new kingdom. You start with a seed. You start with the smallest of seeds. You smart start with just a little tiny bit. You put that into the ground. You water it. And then God makes it grow. And it will grow and grow as long as you keep it watered and you keep uh, the thorns and the weeds from choking it out and you remove any rocks and stones that may uh, somehow get in there that would prevent the roots from growing and all that. And you just keep watering it and you just keep feeding it. Um, it's going to grow and it's going to bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. That's what that parable was about. Take the little tiny bit that you have and offer it and watch and see what God does. And there was so much abundance from this offering that there were 12 basketfuls. And those baskets would have been large baskets, 12 basketfuls left over. And you know, those leftovers blessed other people. I'm sure they took those baskets into various villages and people were blessed with those leftovers. So there was a spilling forth of the blessings that blessed people that maybe hadn't even heard about Jesus yet. Um, and those 12 baskets are significant because there are 12 tribes of Israel. And we know the number 12 is very important. Um, and we know that five is very important. It's It means, uh, uh, it, it's the... Uh, uh, means grace, and that we know that seven is an important number. That's um, God's perfection, and uh, we know that eight is important. That's uh, that means new beginnings. So in the Hebrew language, numbers are very significant, and and they're important to God because they reveal truth. Um, the other important thing about this incident, this miracle, 
is that God um, wanted them to sit down on the grass. Um, and uh, in the one of the other gospels, it says that to sit in groups. So they weren't allowed to stand and clamor and, and, and grab. They had to sit down, which means they had to rest. They had to be in a place of rest. They couldn't worry and be concerned. They had to rest, sit down in an orderly fashion. They were fed and they were able to eat as much as they wanted. And uh, there was an abundance left over. This incident did not... Um, uh, it did not fall on deaf ears, so to speak. Many people saw this for what it was. They saw this as an event that God was showing Israel that one greater than Moses had come because Moses fed them manna in the wilderness. But this was something that was greater than Moses had ever done for Israel. Here was a man coming who fed them fish and loaves with a great abundance that came after it. And it started out small. It started with just a tiny little bit. And it didn't require any work. With the manna, you had to go gather the manna. And uh, if you go look at the Old Covenant, you'll see that the manna changed a little bit. At first, it was flaky and sweet. But then later on, as they grumbled and complained, the manna got a little different. It was kind of grainy, and they had to grind it and make it into a a flour and bake cakes with it and things like that. They didn't even have to work for this. They just sat down in groups and the disciples came and fed them as much as they wanted. And that is the principle of the kingdom. It's very different from the world system. The world system says if you want to receive anything, you have to work hard for it. I mean, you have to toil for it. You have to really suffer and sweat for it. Well, hard work is good. And for those of us who work hard in the areas that God has called us uh, in, actually, that work is fun. It's enjoyable. You know, the, the years and the time and the hours that I've spent studying the Word, for many people, that would be work and drudgery. And, oh, they, they just can't imagine having to study the Bible. How, how tedious. For me, it has been fun and enjoyable. I love it. Um, and there have been other things that God has called me to do that were hard work. But at the time I was doing it, I really enjoyed it and it was fun and it wasn't tedious and um, I didn't hate it and loathe it. I, I, I really enjoyed it and it, it brought great, um, great uh, joy to my heart. And many people can, can say that. Um, so, so there's nothing wrong with working hard, but do you have to work hard? to get the blessings, or can you rest in him? Can you rest in Christ Jesus and know that he is providing for you and know that he is going to work through you? He's going to show you what to do, and then you're going to do it, and it's going to be fun, and it's going to be enjoyable, and there's going to be great fruit, and there will be people delivered and saved and um, brought into the kingdom, and your heart for God's people will grow. The compassion he has for hurting people will be the compassion that you have for hurting people. And, um, and so this is a spiritual principle that all of us in the kingdom of God um, need to remember when he calls us to do hard things. I know at one time um, God called me to draw a picture for a book that, that I had written and I needed a cover. I had to go to a... Um, uh, a seminar and I needed a cover for the book and I had like a, a picture in my mind a vision in my mind of what I wanted to look like but I you know I had to have it done really really quick and I had done some artwork in college and in high school and I was you know I'm not a great artist or anything like that but I just the Lord just said to me why don't you just draw this picture the way you envision in your mind well all I had was an old art box from my kids in elementary school. I had a, a bag of colored pencils and a bag of Sharpie pens and a bag of magic markers and some sketch paper. And so I, I, I used what I had. Those were my fish and my loaves. 
and I used what I had, and I drew a really beautiful picture. Now, it's not great art, but it was a beautiful picture that was very colorful and very meaningful, and I got a lot of compliments on it, and it was perfect for the particular occasion that I needed this picture, um, and so that worked out very nicely. And to be honest, after that, I did more pictures using the color pencils and the Sharpies and the things. And it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. For a season in my life, I did a lot of artwork using those um, particular things that I had. Those were my fish and my loaves. It was just a tiny little bit that I had. I didn't go out and spend um, hundreds of dollars. I used what I had and God blessed it. And it really did bless people, and it blessed me, and it blessed my family. That's just a tiny example of what God can do. All of us have heard stories about people who just take the tiny little bit that they have. I love the story of Chick-fil-A. Drew it, Kathy. What does he have? A great chicken sandwich on a bun with a pickle. And he starts with those three things, and he builds a business, a wonderful business. And... um and, and, and so there are uh, lots and lots and lots of examples in the body of Christ where one can see where people took just a tiny little bit they had and they started small and God blessed it. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And the Kendrick brothers who are making these wonderful movies, War Room right now is a fabulous movie, are another example. They took what they had, uh, the tiny little bit, and they have... It has grown. God has blessed it. So for all of you out there, God is calling you to do something for him. And you say, I don't have the capital. I don't have the resources. I don't have the help. I don't have the support. Take what you have. Offer it up to him. He will bless it. Rest in him and do what he's calling you to do. And you will see a harvest. It may take some time. Uh, it may take years. But you keep at it, and you enjoy it, and you continue to feed it and nurture it, and it will bear food, fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. So we're going to end here on this. Be blessed. Continue to pray and meditate and do all the things the Heavenly Father is calling you to do um, and advance the kingdom. We're living in exciting times. So I'll see you next time. We'll keep talking about Matthew 14. Have a blessed day.